religion is a religion of balance. To be a balanced nation, to be on the middle path, every one of us has his own logic. We have to identify which faction is the one on the correct and middle path. The Prophet ﷺ, he told us, whoever chooses a path other than mine is not considered to be from my followers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Brothers and sisters, we have Brother Asim al Hakim from Saudi Arabia with a BA in linguistics from King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah and a high diploma in Islamic studies from the Umm al Qura University in Makkah. Brother Asim al Hakim has taught. English as a foreign language for 15 years in public schools. He is currently a manager in a leading global industrial company as a public relations officer. He has been an imam for the past 19 years delivering Friday speeches and a variety of lectures in Arabic and English. He has presented TV programs for Saudi English TV channel, radio channel, Al Majad 2 TV channel and Huda TV channel as well as participated in many radio and TV programs worldwide. An articulate and balanced orator to speak on the two extremes and the middle path, brothers and sisters, please welcome Brother Asim al-Hakim. Brother Asim al-Hakim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu Ala mabuuthi rahmatan lil alameen Nabiyyina Muhammadin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Assalamu alaikum Wa rahmatullahi Wa barakatuh Today's topic As you have heard Is about The two extremes and the middle path. Allah, the Almighty, the creator of this universe, has praised us as Muslims in the Holy Quran by saying, you are the best of peoples ever raised up for mankind. And Allah also talks about us in the Holy Quran saying thus we have made you a just a balanced nation so this is what a Muslim should be you have to be balanced and you have to be on the middle path if you look at the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He told us that his followers, his ummah, will be divided into 73 factions, 73 sects. All of it will be in hell, with the exception of one. And I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that He makes me and you among this particular one only one will be in Jannah so the companion said which one who are they and the Prophet sallallahu said it is the Jama'ah it is the unity and not in the sense of numbers because if you look at us Muslims we are great in numbers but we are not a unity we are not a jama'ah. Ibn Mas'ud, the servant of the Prophet ﷺ, who used to carry his ablution 
all the time. And he used to carry the sandals of the Prophet wasallam, who took more than 70 chapters of the Quran direct from the Prophet's mouth. He says, Jama'ah, the unity, is whatever corresponds to truth, even if this meant you were to be alone. And look at the time of Abraham, peace and blessing be upon him. Prophet Abraham was alone, and the whole population of earth was against him. But at that particular time, he was the jama'ah. He was doing what Allah Azza wa Jal told him to do. He was worshiping Allah alone, and that made him the jama'ah. Therefore, for us to know and analyze whether we are from the jama'ah or from the remaining 72 factions and sects, we have to know. We have very limited time. Life is too short. Look at the years that have passed and look at the remaining years. Life is too short for us. We have to identify which faction is the one on the correct and middle path. The middle is usually a point in the center with equal lengths from all sides. And that is why when you have a center of a circle, this means that you are in the middle of it. And this means that if there's a fire, it's gonna eat and consume the outskirts of the circle. And it would reach at the very end to the center. So by you being in the center, you'll be away from all calamities, from all problems, from all bad things that may happen. If you look at Islam, you will find that it is a religion that deals with fitrah, with nature, proper nature, that is. It deals with balance because it addresses your body and it also addresses your soul. And whoever takes care of his soul will elevate to the level of angels. And whoever descends like an animal following his desires and lust, he will be next to the level of animal world. It was reported, and this is in the Sahih of Muslim, that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, once met a companion of Prophet called Hanzalah. And he is different than Hanzalah ibn Abi Amir. Hanzalah al-Ghasil, by the way, was a companion who died as a martyr on the day of his wedding night, the following day. And the Prophet saw him, alayhi salatu wasalam, being washed from sexual impurity, from janaba between the heavens and the earth by the angels. The Prophet was astonished. What is this? So they went to his house. They asked his bride. It was his first night. She said that last night was our wedding night. And when it was morning, it was called for jihad to defend Medina. He went and he died as a martyr in the battle of Uhud, defending Islam and defending Medina. So the angels washed him. Hanzalah ibn Abi Amir. He's a different person. This guy is Hanzalah al-Asadi or al-Usaydi ibn al-Rabi'i. And this man, when he met Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr is checking him out. What's happening? Hanzalah says, I have become a hypocrite. Abu Bakr said, Astaghfirullah. This is a great offense. Being a hypocrite, meaning that you are rejecting Islam, you'll be in hell forever. Why is that? He said, Abu Bakr, when we are with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, MashaAllah, we hear the Quran, we hear the dhikr, we hear the knowledge, we see the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, we feel as if we are next to the angels in faith and belief. But the minute we go back to our homes and we sit with the wives, we play with the children, we look after our farms and trade, we do not recognize our hearts. It's not the same heart. 
Abu Bakr paused for a while and said, well, if this is the case, I believe I have become a hypocrite like you. Tell you what, we have big problems. Let's go and meet the Prophet ﷺ. Imagine this, Abu Bakr, the second in command, the second best man after the Prophets Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who ever walked on earth. Abu Bakr, as siddiq may Allah be pleased with him and join us in paradise with him. Abu Bakr and Hamdullah went to the Prophet ﷺ. They went in and the Prophet looked at Hamdullah. What's going on? What's happening? Hamdullah said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, I have become a hypocrite. And he repeated the same allegation. The Prophet ﷺ smiled and told him, Hamdullah, if you were in the same status at your home with your wife and children, with your farms and trade, as you are with me by Allah on the streets of Medina, you will see the angels shaking hands with you eye to eye. It's an elevation. It's a level. It's the status of belief that once you reached it, and it's possible, if you reached it, you would see the angels because you're so pure that they will shake hands with you. But, alhamdulillah, the Prophet says, an hour and an hour, which means an hour to your Lord in worship, in dhikr, in remembering Allah, and an hour to your heart. You have to have some sort of relief, permissible relief. Nowadays, the brothers and sisters have an hour for your Lord, for Allah, and an hour for your Satan. It's this way. And a lot of the brothers I know have an hour for Allah, and 23 hours for Satan. May Allah have mercy on us. Thursdays provide. In Britain, we are facing one big problem, that are you Muslim or British? The space to talk. In India, back home, they ask, are you a Muslim first or Indian first? And we Muslims should know how to reply, how to turn the tables over. The place to knock. Why Trinity cannot be regarded in that sense, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The opportunity to ask. But even if we agree that what the Christians say, that he was crucified, so if Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died for three days, who controlled the world? That means even God died? The freedom to unmask. So there are various ways which we can prove the argument yeah, to be yeah, wrong. Yeah. Let's meet Dr. Zakir. Every Thursday at 7 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 8 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. It is said that Christianity stands and falls at the cross. Jesus' alleged death on the cross and his rising again form the basis of Christianity. No other religion is so insecurely built around a single historical event. Join me, Arif Islam, for an in-depth investigation of the cross question. The cross question. The cross question. Only on Peace TV. Explore the facts that question the legitimacy of existing Christianity in the Cross Questioned. Next on Peace TV. Our religion is a religion of balance. It's the middle way. It was reported in an authentic hadith that Salman al-Farisi, may Allah be pleased with him, the truth seeker, and he is a topic by his own. May Allah be pleased with him. But Salman al-Farisi, when he came to Medina, the Prophet wasallam joined him and a companion by the name of Abu Darda. They made them brothers. They 
were so close, that was at the very beginning of the hijra of migration, that they could have inherited each other to that extent as if they were from the same flesh and blood. So Salman went to his brother's house and he saw his wife not wearing properly in the sense that she's not taking care of herself. She didn't do any makeup, she didn't do her hair, and she didn't do anything. Well, this was at the very beginning, at the very beginning of Medina era, where hijab was not enforced. So women had the power, had the right to go without wearing the hijab. So Salman looked at his sister-in-law and said, Umm Darda, why are you doing this? Why aren't you taking good care of yourself? She said, look at your brother Abu Darda. He is useless. He prays to Allah all night and he fasted in the daytime. What time is left? So he said, okay, no problem. When Abu Darda came, he saw his brother Salman. So he brought food to him as a gesture of goodwill. You know, when you have guests coming, you feed them. So Salman said to his brother, eat. Abu Darda said, I'm fasting. I can't eat. He told him, by Allah, you will eat. Otherwise, I'm not going to eat. I'm your guest. So Abu Darda said, okay, this is voluntary fast. I'll make it some other day. And he broke his fast. After Isha prayer, when they were supposed to sleep and they didn't have a guest chamber and another one for those who are coming from abroad and a third and a fourth, they had only one room to stay in. Abu Darda stood up and wanted to pray a night prayer after Isha. This is his usual routine from nine o'clock until five o'clock or six o'clock in the morning. It's all standing in prayer. This is the norm for companions and for righteous people. So Salman told him, go to bed. But I want to pray. Go to bed. So he left. He went to sleep. An hour later, he looked. It's night. He wanted to go and pray. Salman told him, go to bed. Not now. And just before Fajr prayer, about half an hour, an hour, Salman told him, now we pray. And they stood up and prayed until Fajr prayer. After they finished, he gave an advice to his brother. He told him, Abu Darda, Allah the Almighty has rights over you. Your wife has rights over you. Your friends or your visitors have rights over you and your body has rights over you, therefore give each one his own rights. This is the balance in Islam. Abu Darda did not buy this. He said, what is Salman talking about? He went to the Prophet to check things out. And the Prophet told him, this is exactly the truth. And you have to follow what Salman, may Allah be pleased with him, told you. If you look at the imbalance in our life, it's overwhelming. You find people, and this is the majority of Muslims, spend almost their entire life as if there is no akhirah, as if there is no hereafter. They work for this life. They live and die for this life. They spend all of the times trying to make a decent and honest or not honest Real, dollar, rupee, or whatever. This is all what they care about. They live and die for their lust and desires. And then on the opposite side, you'll find people who think that they are being good at the side of Allah. So what they do is they stay in their masjid. They stay in their houses of worship, praying to Allah, fasting, doing good things on the surface, but they don't work. They depend entirely on people to support them. So this farmer comes at the end of the day and give them two or three rupees, five, six dollars. And they say, yes, this is their right because I'm worshiping Allah. I'm devoting my time to Allah. And this again is un-Islamic. Nowhere in Islam that tells you devote yourself to Allah in the sense that you don't work, you don't have a family, you don't flourish this earth that Allah Azza wa has given us. There was a man by the name of Sahnoon 
but he was known as Al Kathab, the liar. This man thought that he was very close to Allah, that he is fully devoted to Allah. So he once was praying. He said, Oh Allah, test me, try me, do whatever you want with me. You'll find me a okay. You'll find that I'm a strong believer and I'm patient to whatever you test me with. So Allah Azza wa Jal tested him with a urinary retention. He could not urinate. He drinks water, but he could not urinate. It's an illness. It makes people, you know, squeeze inside of them. So the guy used to walk and wherever he finds children, he would go to them and say, oh children, pray for your uncle, the liar. I've prayed for something and I was lying. I'm not able to test, to withhold or withstand what Allah is testing me with. And this is true. Never ever test Allah. Be humble, be submissive, but never ever test the power of Allah, the Almighty. If you look at Islam, Islam is a religion of balance between this life and the hereafter. But it tells you clearly that whenever there's a conflict, you should choose the hereafter. And this is something that a lot of us don't understand. We're good Muslims. As long as my salary is in my bank account at the end of the month, I'm a good Muslim. As long as my wife is okay and my children are doing fine or doing well. But if there's a calamity, if I had to make the choice between this life and what pleases Allah Azza wa Jal, well, Allah Ghafoorun Rahim. He is most forgiving and most merciful. But my boss is not, so I have to please my boss. Allah the Almighty says, but seek with that wealth which Allah has bestowed on you, the home of the hereafter. And forget not your portion of lawful enjoyment in this world and do good as Allah has been good to you. As stated earlier, this ummah, the followers of the Prophet والسلام, will be divided into 73 factions or sects. But which one is on the winning end? Which one is the one to go into paradise? Islam came to change the convictions of people. It came to change the perspectives, how you look at things. Yet this is something that not a lot of the Muslims are at good terms with, in the sense that, I'll give an example. Our lives, we considered it to be a big picture. I have the wife, I have the children, I have my desires, I have my hobbies, I have my house, I have lots of things. It's a big picture. Islam is a frame that we should not look at anything except through it. So if you're a proper Muslim, if you are a real Muslim, a balanced one, you come to this frame and you put it on the picture and you start cutting the edges from your life. So girlfriends, no, this is not lawful in this frame. Whiskey, intoxicants, no gambling, no riba, no being unfair to people, no, all of this is not accepted. So this, at the end of the day, you'll have a frame that fits the picture 100% like a glove fits a hand. Beautiful. You're a proper Muslim. What a lot of us do nowadays, we bring the picture, mashallah, it's very big. We bring the frame, it's too small. So what do you do? I'll break this edge a little bit. I'll try to put some plastic here. I'll extend that edge a little bit and I'll put super glue here. At the end of the day, I have a frame that is not a proper frame. Your life and mine is exactly the same. We are not proper Muslims in the sense that Allah wants us to be because our priorities are far different what they are supposed to be. Now, to be a balanced nation, to be on the middle path, 
This is something you cannot know without looking through the Quran and the Sunnah. Why is that? Because every one of us has his own logic, his own means of measurement. For example, if I meet someone from Scandinavia, a guy that is seven feet tall, and I tell him, did you see X, Y, Z? He said, uh, which one? The tall person or the short one? His way of identifying tall and short differs from a man coming from, for example, Japan, who is five feet tall. If you bring someone from the NBA, a basketball player, he would look at me and say, look at this midget. I consider myself to be a little bit tall. And if I look at someone who is four feet eight, I would say, oh, look at this midget. And it goes on and on and on. So what is the logic? The origin of all of this is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ.